Today, Paul and Jared are talking about integration for men. Now, we're going to talk about uh, your new program that you got coming out, Be Here Man, which is interesting because your farm was Be Here Farm. And you told me you're still uh, actually growing things for Be Here Farm, even though you guys got burnt out. Yeah. Well, the entire property burned in 2020. And also the farm survived that fire. That's great. Yeah, which is actually, I mean, a, te- a testament to the, the farming practice, actually, because a fire did cross over the entire farm. Mm-hmm. And there's mulch everywhere, you know, because the you know, around the crops and, mm-hmm. and around the trees, there's mulch everywhere in the pathways. And so the fire crawled across the farm and burned all the irrigation lines. It really, truly burned the entire farm. A lot of the fruit trees and things also burned. And then the farm just kept growing, like, you know, mm. the the parts that didn't just get totally scorched. So without irrigation, without farm hands, without any attention, because we were focusing on other sort of rehabilitation of the land right the whole property got burned so it wasn't just the garden Mm -hmm. so we kind of went hands off in the garden for a period of months yeah a few months later you walk into the farm and there's whole heads of cauliflower and whole beds of kale and flowers and berries and wow everything just blooming from the living soil which is obviously the intention of biodynamics so it was cool to see that the soil did in fact stay alive hold its moisture and continue to produce almost all the crops that had been planted before the fire survived. You, you know, that means you just cannot kill Rudolf Steiner. <laughs> He's invincible. Yeah, the spirit was strong. But I'd like to talk about, because we're, we're really talking about integration for men, could you tell me about your own process of dealing with the challenges of manhood, uh, you know, which surely would include your loss of the Be Here farm uh, in the fire in, in September 2020? So maybe you could talk about just some of the stuff you've had to deal with in your own process of individuating into manhood. And that will help us lay the foundation for really talking more in depth about later on about what your new program, um, Be Here Man, is going to be, which is very exciting. I'll, as you'll go through this with us, you'll hear some of the people that are going to be part of this program because jared's put up a real line of men for sure um and for the women listening don't think this isn't for you because this is your chance to understand men and you can't really love somebody if you don't understand them you can try but empathy and compassion and understanding goes a long way in a relationship so i always get worried when i do programs about men because it seems like maybe i'm excluding the women but that's never my intention i love listening to programs by women for women so i can understand women you know i mean we happen to be offering a men's group but as you said it's through be here which is our brand and um there's absolutely in fact most of our customers are are women because the thing that we're most known for at this point is selling skincare products which the you know target audience is commonly women so the you know i'm a man obviously looks like it yeah and so i've personally been attracted to this work and gotten a lot of benefit from it which is why i'm excited to share and create a group to to dive into it with me but the what comes to me when you ask me about integrating as a man is the fact that you know in specific related to the greatest trauma in our life which was the fires and uh for me i mean the farm survived which is beautiful but what did not survive was what you would have thought was like the entirety of my dream and life purpose which is we were developing a hotel on that property right so that was a 10 year long project dealing with the county and the neighbors and dozens and dozens of employees and just thousands of hours of single minded dedication to making this happen and i was co- co- i was working with you at that time mm-hmm. and you know you had sort of like I didn't know what I didn't know, but you had sort of let me know that it was kind of like graduating out of architecture school and designing a skyscraper on day one. Like it was a steep learning curve I had signed up for to Mm -hmm. have my family be my partners on a project, have my wife be my partner, my father be my partner, live on the property with where the employees would be, manage 300 acres, develop all this. So that was what I thought my dream was, or that's what, if anyone was looking at my life, they would have thought my dream was, was to successfully develop and open that hotel. Mm -hmm. So when the fire came, 
making that project no longer possible to you know pursue anybody watching would have assumed that i had lost everything Mm -hmm. it certainly looked like that and it didn't feel like that which began like a six month sort of process of trying to unpack why i wasn't just ready to kill myself um and the only answer for me and i think it's how i integrate everything in my life is oriented around your teaching on the dream line Mm -hmm. my dream was not to develop the world's number one hotel which kind of became the marching orders on the ground that was the project we were developing was to develop the best absolute hotel we could develop but the dream was actually to live in connection with nature Mm. and to create our livelihood around sharing and inspiring people to reconnect with nature as a means for their self-transformation. Right. Which is basically my process as a result of reading How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. Oh, cool. So I had not heard, I mean, like people like you will have me on a podcast to, let's say, talk about biodynamic farming or regenerative principles, or I professionally am involved in these things. And so people think I might know what I'm talking about. But the truth is, is that I didn't, ever hear about the word organic until i read how to eat move and be healthy i mean it basically created a monster in me (laughs) Uh, well it's a healthy monster yeah no a good kind of monster so i would say that the concept of having a dream that was i was more in love with than what i was afraid of Mm -hmm. which is your teaching i feel lucky to have established and named my dream Mm -hmm. and to have been pursuing it at the time of this crisis right because then you have an anchor you know the thing about the dream that a lot of people don't understand is that consciousness takes a lot of energy steiner's very clear about that and most people don't want to be conscious nor do they want to get involved in the spiritual life because steiner says it's crazy making you have to confront your shadows your programming so you're You know, once you're conscious of what it takes to really create freedom in your life, then you've always got one eye open for where you're limiting yourself or where you're bullshitting yourself. So that constant monitoring of your own internal ego, that's the judging super ego that Freud talks about, oh, do this, don't do that. You know, your mom's voice, your dad's voice, whoever's, you know, voice accumulates in there is is uh you know it's it's a lot of work but the the point that i'm driving at is that most people don't really want to be conscious so they like to stay unconscious so that they don't really have to think about things and they just kind of get caught in the ego's habits of thinking that it can can control things or whatever the ego follies get up to but the point is is that most people are so rooted in behaviors even behaviors that are not really happy making for them or not wholesome for them. For example, staying in relationships are not happy and doing jobs they hate going to work every day, but they convince themselves they got to do it for money. You know, drinking alcohol and thinking pot's bad for you when really it's a million times better for you than alcohol on every level. Um, you know, not wanting to do the work to manage their finances so you know so many people just spend themselves into credit card debt like crazy and then their life is very stressful because of that so the point is is that these types of unconscious behaviors and and patternings and programmings that come from school from parents from culture from media they are actually like um inertia you know the the mass you when you go to lift a weight you got to overcome the inertia of the mass that's the hardest part of any lift is getting it moving but the dream if it's an effective dream always creates levity and so what i found as a therapist is that if a person's dream a if they don't have a dream they don't have something to help them to inspire them to overcome the inertia of their habitual life the unconscious life the the repetitive things that they do that they think is them, right? And so um, that's why I always quote Jerry Wesh, who says, if you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis because you've got a direction. You, you know, you can filter. You can ask yourself at any given moment, is this sidetracking relationship or this 
energy and time consuming relationship with person, place, or thing, adding or subtracting to my dream. And so when you have a sense of dream orientation, you actually have a built in compass, and that helps you decide which direction to go or not to go. And it also helps keep you moving toward the horizon of your own choosing, right? So when you lose everything like you did, but you know that you have a dream, you you, you didn't lose the dream. That's right. You lost objects and th- things, yeah. right? And that's there's a big difference in it that. It became a clear separation between them. Yeah. Immediately. And you just described my experience with this process to a T. That's exactly how I felt. Um, the dream uh, was my North Star and immediately was obviously still alive right and had not burnt down so the feeling that i had that sort of tripped me up and got me into like i said like six months of trying to unpack this feeling was an immediate feeling driving off the mountain on fire and feeling like joy and and relief actually (laughs) a sense of relief well you were under a hell of a lot of pressure for a lot of years there i mean i was working on how do you balance all this to do items you know endless to do items and staff challenges and technical challenges with wells and uh you know designs of gyms and everything that goes with it i mean it's a full blown full time hardcore process and like you said when you're living on the land working with your wife and your father there's really no easy escape from the constant pull of things that you know that you got to get done right yeah and it was actually you know it's all been a blessing truly in its in its own disguises but um you know working with my father working with my wife has actually been you know they've been my greatest supports Mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's an overwhelming level of support from them to achieve what does feel like my dream Mm -hmm. like i'm actually a little emotional at it right now um but in real time, the, fr- the, 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 the idea of having a dream big enough that you don't need a crisis is what happened to me because immediately, the, so this dream was all contained to that property. We were developing a hotel as a 300-acre property. My entire universe was reduced to 300 acres, really just focused on that space for 10 years. When it burnt down, the dream, uh, you know, the dream expanded. Yeah. So the dream was all of a sudden applicable to consulting for other people on similar topics. The dream was applicable to hosting the type of programming we would have offered at that hotel. Right. Like Nature Connection, Holistic Health, Regenerative Principles, Amazing Food, Hospitality, offering that anywhere. You know, we host live events around the world now. We have some coming up um, in Italy, in in Idaho. Uh, so... The f- I never would have done any of the things that I've done the last two years had the property not burned down. Right. I also moved to Texas, uh, and we have an incredible community there. So one of the things that we're bringing to the men's group is absolutely another principle that I learned through you, which is I, we, all. Right. And so when I was living on the mountain, um, I was a hermit, mm-hmm. and I was doing a lot of things at the I level that really need to get done at the community level. Mm -hmm. Like starting a biodynamic farm is a really cool exercise, but it's also done in this way at this scale while managing 300 acres is extremely expensive and and difficult. Yeah, And so it only would have really worked if there was then a hotel that was bringing in a lot of money and the garden was a part of that. But obviously that, that premise burned down. And so it really made me realize that community, the the we level, is more appropriate for certain types of activities. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it's just too heavy of a burden to lift. It is. You know, there's the old saying, it takes a tribe to raise a child, and it, and it takes a tribe really to manage a garden of any size. I mean, we have, I don't know, Angie's got 100 and probably 130 or 40 fruit and nut trees. She's got multiple garden beds, a greenhouse, and gardens, spice, herb and spice gardens, and, you know, they're they're all over the place. But the point is, there's a, a lot of hands that have to get involved because there's a lot of watering to do. We, you know, as you know, you got to protect everything from the creatures. I mean, 
Angie and Penny are forever down there getting irritated because the squirrels will just strip everything. And so, and a lot of these things are very expensive too. People don't realize. You know, you're bringing up something interesting that's also sort of relatable to the to the disconnection that I think is the root of why a lot of men will benefit from joining the group, which is that every sort of step away we take from just sort of, you know, being wild, raw mother nature. So in this case, we're all talking about regenerative gardens and farming mm. done to the absolute best that we can, but it's still not just a patch of forest or meadow, right? No. We've manipulated it. We're controlling the water resources. And then you got to take measures to sort of make up for the derivation that you've taken away from mm -hmm. the natural cycle. So you've created this garden bed. Well, now all of a sudden there's the impression that weeds and predators and th gophers and things are attacking your thing. So mm -hmm. you have to defend it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's sort of, you know, how I feel about modern, modern living, which is that, you know, I am lucky that I was living on that mountain, but generally speaking, most of the people I come in contact with live in suburban and urban environments, um, don't get out to deep nature very often. Uh, the people who came on our river rafting trip this summer had never been away from their cell phones for that long in their entire life. How long were they away from them? We were on the river for four days and we were together for about a week. Um, so they did have their phones on when we were in Boise on either end of that trip, but it was just four days, but you know, really f when you step away from your life and your kids and everything, it feels like quite a long time. Yeah. It's a great, it's know. a nice break. Yeah. Hi everybody. I am so excited to tell you about wild pastures, amazing meat delivery service. They have Beef, chicken, pork, and wild caught fish. My family and I have been enjoying their meat for quite some time now, and I just couldn't wait to tell you about it any longer. We had an amazing barbecue this weekend, and I'm still high off the meat. And they use a whole network of regenerative farms, which means that you're getting a different ecosystem from each farm, which means a different nutritional profile, which means nutritional diversity, which means health and vitality which is exactly what we need right now in the world for ourselves and our family so we can all make a difference in the world. And Matt Smith's going to tell us more about this amazing company, Wild Pastures, about their offering and how you can get it. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much, Paul. And I'm excited to tell your listeners what they can get today and how we can help them out. So, you know, as you know, pastured meats are crazy expensive. And so our goal with Wild Pastures is to tap into this network of regenerative farmers and to finally create the solution of where we can get the highest quality meats delivered straight to your door for the most affordable prices around. And so we're on average seeing that we are 40% cheaper than any other delivery option out there. And that our customers have reportedly saved, on average, $1,000 on their grocery bill from meat alone. And so Wild Pastures is a regenerative meat delivery service that is solving this problem. And you can get 100% grass-fed and finished, as well as pasture-raised pork and poultry and wild-caught seafood from Alaska delivered straight to your door. So it's far more convenient. It's far more environmentally friendly because we're using regenerative farms entirely. We don't use feedlots ever. So the, the nutrition profiles are way better. You can definitely taste the difference. I know we were talking about this on our uh, just before we hopped on. You having a Father's Day barbecue and, and how incredible the pasture-raised chicken and beef short ribs were. And you can really taste the difference, right? I'm and still so, high. <laughs> and so our goal is to remove the roadblock from people's minds that if they want to eat healthy, it's too expensive. And so that's where Wild Pastures comes in is we are delivering with our own fleets of trucks whenever possible. We haven't raised our meat prices in over three years at this point, And we're really just creating convenience for the consumer and kind of being the high tide that rises all ships. If we can opt more people into a system like this, the cost stays down for everybody. And so there is a myriad of benefits that go into that. And so today, if your listeners want to try Wild Pastures and taste the difference and experience what it's like, go to wildpastures.com forward slash Paul check or click the link in the show notes and save 20% off for life plus get free shipping for life plus get $15 off your first box. That's a mind-blowing deal. I can't even <laughs> imagine. I mean, I've never heard of an offer like that. And you know, most people will hear an offer like that and think this can't be that good, but I'm telling you it's not it's not only that good, it's really good or I would not be sharing this on my podcast. I think everybody needs to get a hold of Wild Pastures for their family, for their vitality 
for their longevity and for the future of this planet. So thank you guys very much. So Matt, Matt, just repeat the website again. Sure. Just go to wildpastures.com forward slash Paul check or visit the link in the show notes and get 20% off for life plus free shipping for life plus $15 off your first box so you can try it. You'll be glad you did. I didn't even really answer your first question, which was, you know, integrating as a man and kind of like that whole, that whole crisis. What comes up for me about it is the stuff we were just talking about, which was like the loss of my sort of professional dream, which was very much rolled into my personal life as well. But what comes up when you ask me it as a man is sort of that my wife and daughter also had their own personal experiences with that that situation that really had nothing to do with be here at the hotel. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the place where my daughter was born Mm -hmm. and she walked outside to that garden and, you know, it was her world. Yeah. She named the trees, you know, Mm -hmm. she had relationships with, with every aspect of it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, my wife too thought we were going to live there and make our home there for the rest of our lives. So there was a deep, deep loss that the women in my life felt. And honestly, I, I think still feel like if we if a picture of the farm comes up, they both cry a little bit. They mm. both get sad right away. Whereas for me, my North Star was so oriented around the professional aspects of our life that I've felt a lot of joy and expansion throughout this process. Mm-hmm. And um, the the picture that you gave me some odd t- a decade ago or whenever we're talking about was of the you know the bow and arrow and the archer and the bullseye being your dream mm. and the line between me the archer and the bullseye my dream is my dream line mm-hmm. i walk down my dream line by making dream affirmative decisions yeah moment to moment through my life based on values that i've created for myself in the four doctor categories mm. and so I mean, I just can't tell you how much what I would just call living a four doctor lifestyle, which to me is living on your dream line, yeah, has become my entire sort of orientation and, and worldview. The challenge that particularly young men have, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are living this way that aren't young men, and that is just not fulfilling and stepping into the boots of a man yet sort of staying stuck in the child archetype young men that have not indi- or, or men period of any age because this happens at all ages today that have not individuated into manhood have a hard time with responsibility they have a hard time with the ne- necessary challenges of sacrificing in relationships to persons places or things now things can be the responsibility of a, maintaining equipment for example so when I'm asking you about your own process of growing into manhood, I'm saying, what are some of the things you had to work on within yourself so that you didn't fall back into the child position when you need to be a man? Yeah, me personally, what I feel um, was necessary to, was to surrender a lot of things that I thought I wanted. Um, so basically, there were earlier... You know, before I say, you know, before the fire sort of forced my hand, Mm -hmm. there were earlier signs of real difficulty on this project that I chose to ignore in retrospect because I think I was in a childish way not ready to make the decision that perhaps we should go in a completely different direction, Mm. which I think is part of my relief in it burning down Mm. was, you know, six months later or whatever, when I finally sort of unpacked that, I think I had the realization that, wow, that actually would have been a very difficult life had I succeeded in developing that hotel. Mm. Um, Sort of going in the wrong direction uh, and not, not noticing it. So, you know, what I, what I wanted to, what I needed to integrate was the idea of sort of like, blowing through walls in front of me right as opposed to maybe taking two steps back or considering my options with you know the lens of mindfulness Mm -hmm. and and honesty which is hard that's see that's that's another thing that that you have to do to be a man is you got to be honest with yourself and you got to be honest with other people because if you're not you're creating illusions and illusions breed illusions 
and illusions don't usually do good for the bottom line. <laughs> That's sort of the shadow side of how, mm. how big this dream was, was that the dream was so big that it was very compelling and sucked everybody in my family on board. Mm -hmm. Everybody was excited about it, and nobody was ready to let go of it um, for fear of you know letting me down or letting the thing down or mm -hmm. just having become attached to the idea that we were going to succeed at it. Mm -hmm. And then you know one day it's just not an option because if the, the whole place burned down, right? I sort of learned this through the pain teacher, I would say. Yeah, well, you also had invested a hell of a lot of money, so. To, to go that far into the process 10 years in and have it burned down, that's a lot of time and energy you can't recuperate. So there's a real, um, there's a real grieving process that goes with that, isn't there? I mean, I would say that yes, but I was also quite lucky in the sense that this was a, a family investment. So I just was kind of counting my lucky stars because had had we taken on, you know, institutional investors or multiple partners outside of the family, I think it would have been a lot, a lot worse. But really what we experienced was less the, the financial side of it and more the human grieving side of it. You know, it was, um, there's obviously conversations between, you know, my father and myself on the investment side of it, but the, as as hard as those may have been to to discuss there there was nothing harder than the ongoing conversation i still have with my daughter about you know what you know missing the farm yeah not living there mm -hmm. and like you know if something goes missing in the house even if it makes no sense she'll her memory will be like oh i think that burned down in the fire mm. it's just like a big part of her life right and we haven't even been back to the property so it's a pretty stark sort of rug pull mm -hmm, from, from her perspective. Yeah. You know, what, we're, what I'm really trying to bring out here is, is what does it take, in your opinion, to, to step into man's shoes? Because we've got a world full of young men and men that are just not doing it. You, you see, when you don't have warriors, and, you know, that's what initiation right is for, is to produce warriors to protect the tribe, to protect your resources, to protect the people you love, and to sustain life as we know it, then you don't have anything to protect you from the big bad <laughs> big bad wolf. And there was, there's lots of wolves around these days, but there's not very many people defending against the wolves. So uh, if you look out in the world today and you look at your own life and say, you know, I'm curious why I'm asking this question is because if you see, if you're bringing together a group of elite men to guide young men, what is it that they need to be aware of that they need help with? Because a lot of them are too unconscious to even know that they're acting like boys. Yeah. Right. And I'm talking about guys like I, I've studied Leonard Sachs's work and he makes it very clear that we have a huge problem with men that are up into their 30, 35 years of age, still living in their mother's house, mom and dad still paying the bills for them while they surf the internet day and night and play video games. And they can't even hold relationships with women because they're just too childish. And he also shares many comments from women about all the challenges they're having dealing with these men that are not men. They say, I don't want a boy, I want a man. And there's just none of them out there. Yeah. I would say the point of the group is to inspire the guys to pull their dream and their best selves out of themselves. And I think that fits every person uniquely. So that's why really for me what it comes down to is mindfulness practice. Right. Um, so the, well, let me start with the, the visiting master. So it's you, Paul Check. So I'll be, I'll be talking about the dream line. Yeah, we're bringing Paul in as the first visiting guest to speak about the dream line, which is, for me, the North Star of everything, like I said. So it's like an obvious place to start. We're bringing in Laird Hamilton, Alex Gray, Eben Britton, Cal Callahan, and then my brother Jason. Mm. Um, so this is happening every two weeks of a 12-week program. Every first and third and fifth, you know, every other week, is what we're calling the internal sessions where we'll be meeting with my co-facilitator who is going to be a guest on the show soon 
Edmund Knighton. Oh, good, yes. And so Edmund is, you know, one of the leading scholars a- around on anthroposophy, on Steiner's work. Yes. And he's got about four decades of experience um, at all different levels, including as a Waldorf administrator. He was actually my daughter's teacher for a period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and a couple decades of experience with many different types of men's work, which men's groups, I should say, which I don't actually relate to very much. Um, so I'm in that sense, a funny person to be hosting this, but we also created this group specifically out of the things that, you know, sort of rubbed me wrong about men's groups. Well, that's what I want you to say because people listening might get the wrong impression when you say you don't relate to men's groups, but you're running a men's group. But I think what you're really saying is you don't relate to the way most men's group run. That's why you're doing it differently. Exactly. In my experience, I've sort of always felt like I was just listening to people share their problems, um, which can be a relief and it can be uh, have some benefits and it can work wonders for, for certain people. But for me, I'd always sort of feel like I was lacking practical tools on, on how to really handle my problems. Right. Um, also, you know, depending on the group, they might not be completely resonant with me. We may not be like-minded, which is, again, has its benefits to meet people from all sorts of walks of life. But another main inspiration from this group came from the fact that, like I said, I was a hermit for about 10 years. When I moved to Austin, um, uh, within the first couple of weeks, I was invited to join a men's group with Cal Callahan, one of the one of the mentors in my group. And that was also pretty life-changing for me. So to in addition to mindfulness practice, what I think men of this time are missing is strong communities of men who are working together to help, you know, lift each other up and solve their problems in a community while being honest, open, vulnerable. These are all the things that we're basically, you know, not trained to do. Right. So we're seriously lacking them as, you know, as a gender. Yeah. It's part of the dilemma of our education. It's also part of the unfortunately, the religious programming that so many people get in childhood where they're subservient to authority and parents emulate that kind of authority. And so, you know, children are meant to be listening, not talking and all those kinds of things. So you, you, you kind of, young, young people get programmed right out of thinking for themselves. And right. And that's where, you know, from my perspective, that's where it's not just for men because I have a daughter. I mean, that's where Waldorf education has shined for me because, you know, I talk about this with my brother, but um, that's the beginning of this sort of continuum of, you know, institutionalization or domestication of our much more natural tendencies, which would be to be a whole person and not to you know, repress these sides of us that are sissy or whatever is not manly or something like that. And so, you know, to define the problems for the different aged men who might find benefit in this group, it's really, you know, any adult male because on average, all of us have sort of already gone through that childhood where we weren't really allowed to be boys um, to, to the fullest extent. Um, and you've mentioned, so we're now not really able to be warriors um, to a fully integrated extent. We're not going to, you know, there's kings out there who haven't integrated their warrior and don't have a child heart and, you know, never going to grow up to be wise masters. Right. And so mm-hmm. w- w- what what more can we do but come together, you know, state our dreams and work, you know, to achieve them through getting in deeper connection with ourself. With also though too your the the men you've chosen to lead the group are all doing it. They're well they're all not only doing doing it at a very very high level. I the mean highest, they yeah. are there are they're kings and wise men. So I mean I know all those people and they're all very very unique highly accomplished um men. Um I mean you don't how, how do you top Laird Hamilton for God's sakes? I mean one of a kind. And knows how to make shit happen, right? And, and and Cal Callahan was a very successful stockbroker. Jason's obviously very successful. Um, even uh, Britain, you know, he's been on the podcast, so people have probably listened to that if they're listening to this. If you haven't, it's a great podcast. Uh, you know, every, everyone that is on there is probably going to have a trail of tears on the way to their, you know, 
wise man stage. So, you, you know, you don't get there without a lot of <laughs> hard knocks. And I think that's part of the problem is, is that every, as a sort of a stereotypical statement, a lot of the young men that are caught in not being a man are afraid to deal with the real challenges of manhood because the culture we've uh, created is an instant gratification culture. It's, you know, if you don't have the money to buy it, use a credit card. If you don't feel like doing the things you should be doing, play another video game. Uh, you know, I think that having men that know how to be men and know how to avoid the pitfalls. For example, my son, Paul Jr., he's 44 now. He's got a child of his own. He's got three boys with his partner that came from her previous marriage. And I said to my son, I said, what do you think some of the biggest challenges young men are facing? And he said, one of the things that they, two things he pointed out was one, they spend too much time playing video games and so they get caught in the digital world and forget about the responsibilities and realities of the analog world, nature, life. And the other thing he said is that a lot of young men don't know when to stop researching. They'll just keep compiling and compiling and compiling and compiling, but they don't go to an action phase where they bring things to a conclusion and say, okay, I've made a decision. This is what I think happened. And then what am I going to do about it? How do I go out into the world and do something about it? Or help educate people or, you know, take it from a place of trying to come to a decision to making a decision to saying, how do I actually import that research and that conclusion into something that I can share and help other people with versus just being someone that just spends millions of hours researching stuff. And, and so the cost of that is, is that you have a lot of young men that have wives and kids that are not getting supported. They're financially struggling but instead of doing the things that a young man or a man should be doing, they're doing all the things that boys do. Hi, everybody. I sure hope you're enjoying the podcast. You know, a couple of months ago, Organifi sent me a couple of bags of their new Sheila J gummies to sample, and I was blown away with how great they taste and how much my body loved them. Having used Sheila J paste for many years, I've never been a big fan of the taste of it, but when I tried Organifi's new Shilla J gummies, I was truly impressed. The texture and consistency of the gummies is excellent, and they have just enough natural sweetness to let me feel like I'm getting a lovely, healthy treat for both my mind and my body. Shilla J is a unique, potent mineral paste from the Himalayan mountains. It contains an abundance of trace minerals, antioxidants, organic acids, and nutrient-transporting compounds. It's been known throughout history to help boost vitality and strength. Just pop a couple gummies and chew or suck on them slowly for a steady release of the delicious, earthly, but slightly sweet natural flavor. Your taste buds will enjoy the delicious treat while your body soaks up the massive amounts of feel-good nutrition. Rich in fulvic acid, humic acid, vitamins, enzymes, bioflavonoids, antioxidants, metabolites, and over 40 trace minerals, Sheila J gummies can help support energy production, support performance and recovery, support healthy muscles, promote collagen synthesis, support healthy hormone levels, increase cellular energy, decrease fatigue, and promote heart health. I absolutely love Organifi Sheila J gummies and went through two bags in no time because my body craved them so much. I reached out to Organifi to get more right away, and I bet you will too. To get your 20% off for Living 4D listeners on your Sheila J gummies, go to Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash C-H-E-K 20. On checkout, use the promo code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20, two zero. That's check 20 on checkout to get your 20% discount on your awesome Shilla J gummies. I honestly love these things. I know you're going to be just amazed with how great they taste and how good they feel. Yeah, so I mean, I guess like, I guess my program is sort of giving people the benefit of the doubt that if given tools to go inward and start to, you know, depending on where they are in their life on, on mindfulness practice, to either have a basic understanding or to, you know, deepen their understanding of how to control their thinking and control their, 
their willpower and um, basically Steiner's insights of what we call his six levels of mastery is an undercurrent of our program. So mm -hmm. this is a subtle exercise. You know, it's not for people who are, are looking for instant gratification. These are, you know, mindfulness practices that basically plant seeds in your soul that very slowly flower mm -hmm. and in, you know, congruence with one another result in a new state of being that is a much more mindful and balanced state of being that allows you to make better decisions and be aware of the fact that you're maybe going down a rabbit hole on the internet playing video games, you know? Yeah. So there's a there's a disconnect from the natural way of things if you're spending, you know, 19 hours on, on a video game. Um, there's a major disconnect. And so the the six exercises that will underpin the visiting masters and will be sort of tied together with the what the masters bring to the program is um, control of thinking. This is basically an exercise where you take an item that is you don't have strong emotional attachment to, like a rock. Anything, yeah, except it can't be a rock because you want to find a novel one. So Paul took that away from you. So anything besides one, the examples that we use today, find a novel one. So I find this coaster and then I'll just spend five minutes. I'll use a timer because I don't want to have to, you know, think about it. But you spend five minutes just thinking about this object and any thought that logically you can connect to this object for five minutes straight. Yeah. After a while of practicing that, you do have a sense of being able to do it with much more clarity. Mm -hmm. And, you, and you, you know, that, that, that stays with you throughout the day. Um, the next exercise, so these will go in two week cycles and they build on each other. The next one is the control of will. And so you, you'll do, you know, you'll, it could be as simple as I will every day go and move this item. And, um, that sounds silly, but you know, the example I think in the Steiner lecture is, you know, every day I'll go water this plant. But yes. you, you come up with some action that you're not particularly emotionally attached to, and you go do it anyways. You do it once a day, every single day for two weeks. You actually can continue these exercises. So the first one, you can keep doing that for five minutes a day, and you can keep building on these. The third one is a sense of equanimity. So when you feel laughter coming on, you know, don't laugh. When you feel crying coming on, don't cry. Not as a way of living, but just for this exercise, mm -hmm. just just to develop the feeling of these emotional currents within you and yeah. the ability to control them a little bit. Yeah, there not is, let them take you over. Yeah, that's part of mindfulness training is is not to get caught in, but to rise above. Or in alchemy, it's called sublimation, getting above something. When you know you've used that word mindfulness several times, and there's a lot of variations of it. What what? How would you define what you're calling mindfulness? What is it that you do that's mindfulness? For me, it's I don't know. Two things are coming to me. One, it's being present in my body. Mm, that's important. Um, so, which has a lot behind it because maybe I'm you know in touch with f sensations or maybe we're talking about muscle testing or soul testing for food selections. So using my body as a listening tool mm. uh, in the present moment. Um, the other one is sort of like applying the lens of mindfulness or maybe a synonym in, in this moment for me would be presence, mm -hmm. but applying that lens to my decisions. So, before I go eat something, just thinking about what are the ingredients in this and yes. how does it work for me, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I've placed the lens of mindfulness in between me and my actions. Good, yeah, very important. That's what I mean by it. Um, yeah. And so that that exercise, that's the end of three weeks. I think we did three. That's equanimity. The next one's positivity. Mm. So finding a grain of positivity in, in, you know, even nasty things right. as an exercise. The result being great expansiveness ultimately mm. seeing positivity in the world where you were formerly seeing negativity connects you with these things much more um the last one where are we at positivity openness openness remaining yeah. open mm -hmm. hearing something that sounds foreign to you and saying you know what there might be something to that or being willing to listen to and consider even the most diametrically opposed positions to your own. Exactly. Um, that's one of the 
problems that has caused so much trouble in the last few years is people were unwilling to look at the evidence on the opposite side of the fence. That's what's called having a dogma, right? That's a closed, a closed, closed, mind. closed yeah. mindedness, which is dangerous. And, um, you know, what I've done in my life as my library is a testament to is I've always looked at both sides of every opinion or, or idea or concept so that I can see how a variety of minds perceive something so that I can say, okay, well, someone who's very against, uh, you know, the use of marijuana, let's say, what is their viewpoint and where do they get the viewpoint? How do they build the viewpoint? And then I often will go look at resources if they cite any, which often people that are dogmatic don't cite resources. That's one of the th first things you learn is it's it's not really based on evidence. It's based on opinion or emotion or programming. And so I'll track the references down and see how these things um, basically built up. Like how does how do you get to this viewpoint? And then I look at the other side of it, which either one of which I could be on, and I say, then I have a, a nice holistic view, and I can see how the puzzle pieces fit together. But the problem is, is to do that it takes a fair bit of time and effort, and a lot of people are too lazy to actually really do the work of, of what I call holistic thinking to to really look into a problem deeply enough. Which is why that thinking exercise is very good, because a lot of people will just go numb staring at a coaster after five minutes it can be difficult when you first practice this exercise for sure yeah it sounds simple you know whereas positivity is uh an expansion exercise basically openness is a streaming in exercise so mm -hmm. now things are coming to me through my openness and then that's five the sixth one technically is to combine all of them so right. uh to bring them all together and uh I mean, gosh, that is sort of the undercurrent of the course is those are the most basic exercises of the course that everybody, um, you know, ideally will be practicing daily and, you know, sharing, reporting back on. And as we go, uh, the course will sort of take on an I, we, all direction, which I've said twice now, but I mean, is that, you think that's something that's been discussed on the pod that's clear to people what, what that means, I, we, all? I th I think it's been brought up a, a number of times, but I think it's one that never gets worn out. So yeah, I mean, uh, for the me, I we all is very important. So yeah, go ahead so, and lay it on the table. Well, well, the takeaway of I we all for me is that you know I being myself, we being my closest relationships, family, etc., all being you know less close in group and communal relationships, and you know the community of the entire world. Um, basically, at each level, I carry with me any detriment from the prior level. So if I'm yeah. operating at 80% my best possible self, I'm taking in a 20% detriment to all of my relationships with my wife and daughter, et cetera, which is compounded by whatever detriment they're bringing in on their side. Yeah. So if she's coming in at a 20% detriment, our we level relationship is just operating as status quo at 40% below its optimal. Well, it's actually worse than that because if you're coming in at 80%, there's already 80% or 20% of you she cannot access. Right. So there's a 20% deficit on both sides. When right. anyway, if I show up right now to do this podcast and 20% of me is somewhere else, there's 20% of me that you can't access either. So paradoxically, we imprint our deficit right into the person we're with because in order for you to have a real conversation with me, I've got to be here. But you can't have a relationship with the other 20% because it's somewhere else. So that, you know, this is why when I teach I, we all, I say, look, you got to be really conscious of the fact that if you're not in yourself and present and clear about what the function or the purpose or the mission or the vision or the values of being with somebody else is, then you've really got no reason to be present. You know, that's, which means you probably should be doing something else. The real key reason I put I, we all together as a concept is one, we have so much religious programming about don't think of yourself, always think of others first. But I've seen so many people get very sick, especially women doing, burning themselves out, doing everything for everybody else, trying to be a good Christian or whatever their religion is, 
but that totally negates the fact that we are 50% of every relationship. And if we don't take care of meeting our needs, for example, look how many people tell me as clients, patients, I don't have time to cook for myself, or I don't have time to shop for good food, or I don't have time to go. The only place I can find good water is 20 miles away, and I don't have time to do that. I say, well, look how much time you're spending here coaching with me and how much money, because you didn't do that, right? So the reality of it is, if we don't really have a big enough dream to inspire ourselves to be fully involved in our life for ourselves, then we keep making excuses about why we don't have the time or the energy to do the things that are necessary to maintain our first relationship, which is with ourself. And then that just becomes a snowball right into the other three levels. So by the time you get to the all level, what you got is a bunch of non-participatory beings because the problems that you get created for not being present with yourself and not being present in relationships with key people in your life is that you get burned out, you get frustrated, and you don't really have much to give to the all except burnout and frustration, and there's already plenty of that out there. And right now, as I've said a million times on my podcast, it's an all-hands-on-deck situation. We've got, yeah. we, we got social problems, we've got political problems, we've got financial problems, we've got institutional problems, we've got ecological problems, uh, and you know the list is very, very long. So if, if you don't have yourself managed well enough and you're not clear about your values and what you're willing to fight for and die for, then you don't know who should be in your we relationships, right? If, if you don't really know how to harmonize with people with the same values, you know, there's an old saying that I like to quote, no man or woman can do anything meaningful in the world alone. Mahatma Gandhi couldn't take India back from the British by himself. He had to convince the entire nation to work with him to be nonviolent in very scary dangerous situations. The point is we all need each other. And the, uh, right now, there's a, a real deficit of people being present with each other. Paradoxically, having studied Leonard Sachs's work on, on the boys and the girls, the counterbalance, the, you know, for every yang, there's a yin, for every yin, there's a yang. Well, as the men have become more and more yin, the women, the females have become more and more yang. So what sure. we're seeing is a, a huge problem with young women reaching frustration and burnout and they're trying to do so much so you end up seeing that the lack of manliness leads to too much masculinity in women which leads women to burnout which then leads women to not being able to parent effectively and and fortunately there is a lot of men's groups popping up i mean have you seen that yeah, of course. They're all over. They're the everywhere. Yeah. They're everywhere. I mean, it's everything. I've you can't even count them all anymore. So you can see that the the medicine's trying to evolve. It's coming out of the yep. unconscious. Yep. And I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot of value in uh, in men doing it for sure. Obviously, you know, I don't think that just about ours. But um, like I said, I didn't relate to a lot of the options out there, and I wanted to do something through our lens. And in particular, I wanted to bring in these masters who, you know. Mo I was able to arrange these guys to come and sit at the group. That's actually one of the most interesting things about the men's group right now because the men who are going to sign up for it haven't even signed up yet. So we don't even know what the dynamic of the group is going to be. Ultimately, that's going to be the most interesting thing is the men who come together and the work we do together and the bonds that we form and you know the growth and the transformation that we as a group experience. But in terms of the appeal side... Um, you know, to to get in the room with Paul Check or Laird or Alex Gray and to be able to ask them whatever you want is a rare enough gift in itself. I mean, one of the things that we as men are lacking is just leaders and examples yeah. who are who are doing this and who have done it. And in the cases of most of you on the list, have been doing it for decades longer than your peers at mm -hmm. a level higher than them. I mean, it's really easy to look at Laird and just be, you know, know that that's probably a sport that younger people you know were traditionally doing before him certainly at the level that he does it um and so how these people do that is what we want to do that's what young men want to be able to do um mm -hmm. and the desire to do it ultimately comes from having a dream you know that mm -hmm. will give you that inertia like you said to do it mm -hmm. and the well, playing too many video games and feeling like you don't have enough time to it well hopefully 
the carrot of the excitement of maybe being able to sit in the room with one of these visiting masters makes you think you do have enough time because maybe that sounds worth it. But the truth is, is that in the group, what you're going to do by joining is you're going to make the time. So all of a sudden now you're going to realize that 90 minutes once a week you did have, and Mm -hmm. there's going to be five minute exercises that you do at home and you did have it. And that little bit of taking yourself you know, seriously, as compared to just all the responsibilities around you, whether it's work, family, video games, whatever it is, Netflix, whatever it is that's dedicating so much of your time, it's obviously not something that's serving you um, at the eye level so that you can meet your family and be a better husband, employee, boss, whatever whatever position you're in right now, whatever we relationships you're in right now. Um, So the point of the program was to create something compelling enough so that guys could make the time to work on on their eye level and so they could perform better at the we and all level and the program will take us through that somewhat intentionally so in the beginning we'll be focusing like you're you're the first guest who's coming in we're focusing on the dream you know that's pretty much down at the eye level for these guys yeah each each guy is going to have their individual dream and by month two you know we'll be focusing more at the we level month three the all level well, many of them may not have a dream, and hopefully I'll be able to inspire them to do that. Hello, everybody. After countless requests, I'm super excited to announce our How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy online training program. This program is designed specifically for anyone that wants to learn how to eat, move, and be healthy, and is perfect as a learning opportunity for the whole family. In my 40 years as a holistic health practitioner, I've always been saddened and amazed that there is no real basic health training in our education systems that teaches people how to care for their body and enjoy the freedom that only health can give. Anyone will be able to follow my How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy online and learn many ways to apply what I share in my book. And to give you even more support, this offer includes a free How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy ebook to help reinforce your learning process. In fact, If you've not yet read my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, you can take this special six-week How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy online training program and get instant coaching on how you, your family, and friends can look and feel your best. You will not only learn from me personally, but you will learn from Angie Check, head of Holistic Lifestyle Coaching at the Czech Institute, Matthew Walden, head of education for the Czech Institute, and Joe Rushton, who is a Czech Institute instructor and certified chef. All our presenters in this course are highly skilled and add tremendous value to this excellent training program. How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy Online will be available as of January the 9th. This course is $495, but as a Living 4D listener, you get a special launch discount of 40% off and can make three payments of $99. Again, you get a free How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy ebook to help you look and feel your best and support your learning with the online training program. This offer is only available until January the 31st. Take advantage of this incredible offer and get started creating the new you. Go to C-H-E-K dot, so C-H-E-K, the word C-H-E-K lowercase dot group forward slash capital L number four D dash E-M-B-H. Once again, that's C-H-E-K dot group forward slash L number 4D dash E-M-B-H. I have received countless letters from people around the world about how they healed many things that ailed them and how they look and feel better and have much more energy. And many mothers told me that how to eat, move, and be healthy has been a miracle for their children too. Enjoy this opportunity to make your 2024 a year of health, vitality, and enjoy a new level of freedom that you have never had before. A lot of people hear the word dream and they they don't really understand Mm -hmm. what it means. They think like fantasy or, or, you know, they don't really realize what a dream and a, a dream is something bigger than yourself but if your dream's not bigger than yourself then why bother (laughs) you know like my 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 longest running dream has been the czech institute and to educate as many people at the highest level as i possibly could 
because my goal wasn't to train the masses. That would have numbed my mind because I would have had to keep my own output down to the level of the average person, which would have been just painful as hell for me. So my dream was to create the masters that went out and taught the masses, which is what Czech professionals are. They're far, far more skilled by far than their competition, um, comparatively speaking. And it's a multidisciplinary culture. So you have every kind of different health and exercise professional involved. But the dream is really synonymous with a goal or an objective. The difference between a goal or an objective is it a dream like be here was a dream that had to have many stages of goals and objectives to be met in order to fulfill the embodiment of the dream. Like, you know, I've constantly got goals and objectives to meet. I have a schedule every day. I've got things I have to get done. And that's always my first task, right, is to meet what's right in front of me. But the dream is, is how do you structure your life so that by staging the process, you, you know, just like you had a 10-year project there, you don't just build a hotel overnight. You don't you know, take 300 acres of standing timber and wave your fingers and everything's cleared out. And, you know, there's a lot of planning and a lot of work. So you have to stage the dream out. Um, for example, when I develop a new course, my dream is the course. Like right now, I'm writing a 15-volume set hmm. of books, Right. And so then I have to say, okay, my dream is, and here's the general outline, but then I say, okay, you know, there's 40 chapters, and, and then I have to do an outline for each chapter, and then I have to say, okay, I'm going to start writing now, but then I got to look at my schedule and say, well, I've got these podcasts to do, I've got these clients to see, I've got this filming to do, I've got to find time to exercise and take care of myself, and I have to find time for my spiritual practice, I got to find time for my kids and my wives. And so, you know, there you see the task of a man. It's right there in front of you. But the key point is if, is if you have a dream that's significant enough to make you have to grow, but you don't have the discipline to stage the daily proportions of it, the weekly, the monthly, the yearly, then you can get lost in not how, knowing how to make progress or how to bring something to completion And this is one of the challenges you see young people just going around in circles. They have pie in the sky dreams, but they don't know how to climb the steps to get to the next level of themselves. And so one of the things that I wanted to talk about in this regard is is the importance of qualifying a dream. When I'll say, what is your dream? I hear things like, oh, um, I want to make a million dollars next year. Well, my first question is, what's the most money you've ever made in a year? you know, oftentimes the answer is somewhere between thirty-five and $60,000. I'm like, well, okay, well, that's not a well-qualified dream. So you, you have to qualify a dream and say, okay, is it realistically achievable? Who do I need to get involved? What skills am I going to need to develop? But the other aspect of qualifying a dream is asking yourself, how committed am I? How much love do I have for this dream? And so the scale I use is if your dream doesn't excite you and you don't have at least a seven plus out of 10 buy-in, a seven or more, you're probably never going to do the work to make that dream come alive. So for those of you listening, first come up with your dream, but then ask yourself, how committed am I to this? Yeah, would you say it's fair that if somebody had that dream? Because I had a conversation with a guy the other day. I kind of broke the dream line down to him. Um, and he was sharing back with me that, you know, he's got some serious addictions mm-hmm. and he's in recovery. And so he doesn't have a dream. And so I sort of reframed it for him and I said, well, it sounds like recovery is your dream. It is your dream. And you're allowed to have nodes along your dream line mm-hmm. of multiple incremental dreams. So maybe. Mm-hmm a little bit of the way into your dream of recovery, you can start seeing those next nodes if you can't see them now. But you're on your dream line if you're achieving your recovery. That's your most immediate dream. Whenever you don't have a clear dream, such as somebody in recovery, the most important thing to do is identify your nightmare because that's where most of your life force energy is entangled. That's where your um, worries are, your fears are, your concerns are, your wounds are your inhibitions are, your insecurities are, 
that's often where a lot of your painful relationships are entangled, problems around, you know, whatever your nightmare is. So when someone has an addiction, um, that's usually quite a challenge in for themselves and their relationships. And so with with uh, that type of situation, I say, okay, well, let's make your nightmare your first dream to resolve because until you resolve the nightmare, you won't have the energy to go into a dream beyond the nightmare. But at the same time, if I'm working with someone that's addicted or badly wounded or whatever, if I can identify a dream, even though they have a nightmare, then the nightmare just becomes the first goal on a way to achieving the dream. Because if I can get a good dream that's a real, that really opens their heart up, I can, I can use that as a well of, of life force. I can use that as a well of inspiration and creativity and motivation. And so then it becomes easier knowing what you're trying to do and, and who you're choosing to become each day to then go back and address the addiction or address the uh, tendency to be late all the time or you know the vices, right? We have virtues and vices. And a lot of what limits young people is they're so caught in their vices. And oftentimes the nightmare is very important to address because if, until you address the nightmare, you're at great risk of not really knowing who you are. Because most nightmares are created by living illusions and living programming. Like an illusion is, I don't have the money for this new car, but I'm going to buy it anyhow and I'm going to go way into debt. But the illusion is <laughs> that you, should, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have bought the car in the first place, right? You should be eating real food, right? And I've had many people come to me with very expensive cars that are eating garbage food all the time because they say they now can't afford real food. So there's a, a nightmare based on an illusion. So once we work through all this stuff, it really helps build the discipline, right? To get over an addiction or to get over some of these bad habits is the first step in learning the discipline of a man, of a warrior. And then from there, you get more confidence in yourself. You have more life force energy. You start doing some healing work, some relationship work, some self-reflection work, some shadow work, some you know mindfulness practices. And then you come out of this thing and you say, wow, you know, now that I'm through this, I didn't realize how lost I was. I didn't realize how confused I was or how I was medicating myself to deal with, say, the pain of my challenging parental relationships or the traumas that I've been unable to heal. But now you're clear about yourself. And interestingly, having worked with a lot of people in these challenges from addiction to violence in the family to sexual abuse, it's not unusual when I start with them to find out what their dream is. But after six months to two years of therapy, their dream changes because they've changed. And so just like you know, you mentioned, be here the hotel project turned out not to be the ultimate dream. And you had whispers that indicated that, but it was too scary to look at. So only when the fire came and the great mode of transformation put you in the position to really say, okay, now I I can see why I had those whispers in my head because my ultimate dream was this. But you see, there was a 10-year process of growth into manhood to get you to the point where you could look the dream in the eyes and say, well, maybe this is actually a better position to be in. Well, I was just going to say that in the context of the group, the men are going to have to, you know, be able to qualify their dream because there's going to be the accountability of sharing, you know, we're going to have to be sharing this with one another. Um, and there'll be different ways of doing it. Um, but ultimately you're going to identify and state your dream as the North Star of this process, or your life more generally. Just out of curiosity, how long is the presentation that each of the experts give? Everybody's coming in for, you know, 75 to 90 minutes, but it's obviously like we're not going to hang up on an expert. So right, <laughs> we, we, just, uh, we, we also aren't going to be taking up, you know, hours of their time. But Yeah, I just wanted to know because I want to make sure that what I put together um, is not oriented just on me talking, but I want to actually take these people through exercises where they I ask them to write something down, like what is your dream? 
And then I say, okay, now let's qualify that dream. And here are the steps that you go through to qualify a dream so that when they're done, they actually can leave with something tangible in their hands where they go, okay, now I know how to define the difference between a dream and a goal, how to be clear on an objective, and all the things that I think are very, very important from a lot of practice. Yeah. And then, you know, as a group, we're going to, you know, support one another to get through that process with, with clarity. Yeah. And then commit to it, take action on it. It's harder to overcome inertia if you're with people that are in the same process, you know, that, that are making the same commitment. Like, for example, it's very hard for an alcoholic to stop drinking if everybody else in the house is drinking all the time. So if you don't have an environment of people that are sharing a common mission, common dream, and common values, then it's really hard to break out of uh, habitual program behavior because you're surrounded by people that are trapped in it. And also people that are caught in habitual program behaviors, we'll call those miserable people, tend to love company. And so there's a real tendency for people to pull dream weavers down. Right, because then they don't want to have to look at themselves. You see, as long as someone around you is not making a million dollars a year or not building a successful business or not accomplishing athletic objectives or not losing weight, then you don't have to look at yourself. So one of the key things for dream building is you have to be aware that there'll be a lot of people often, unfortunately, the most common challenges are your own family members that are going to tell you all the reasons that you're never going to succeed but that's part of the process of individuation into a whole person that doesn't need to be validated from the outside. It might even be a form of validation that you're on the right track. Well, it can. It can be a real good indicator. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, huh? <laughs> you know, as the old saying goes, you can always tell who the pioneers are. They have arrows in their back. Yeah. Well, I just, I mean, like even with my food choices, you know, people, I could tell that my food choices are different based than the average person based on the intense feedback that I get from people. Right. They're either very impressed and they think, wow, I really, this is the level of detail I'd like to take into my food sourcing and family's nutrition. Or they're almost angry at me and they'll accuse yeah. me of maybe being like... Um, A fanatic. <laughs> having an eating disorder. Yes. Or, or something, you know, because I'm so focused on food mm -hmm. quality. And for me, it's the greatest joy of my life. Yeah. I love thinking about where my food comes from and, yes. and my family's nutrition and all the mm -hmm. products that come into our home and you know the the gate of our farm the door of our house and our our mouths these are sacred thresholds yeah. that we really apply the lens of mindfulness to yeah you know those thresholds are very very important because most thresholds have something on the other side and you don't always know what's on the other side. Like the transition from boyhood to manhood is a threshold. You don't know what's on the other side. That's what makes it a real uh, rite of passage or a real journey. When you state your dream, you don't know what is going to be um, challenging on the way to it, right? There's, it's a hero's journey, right? You, you know, it's kind of like um, I'm watching that TV series at your brother's suggestion, 1883, about oh, when people, great. you know, moved yeah. west. And it, it, it's a real good look at how hard it was to go out and, and be free and deal with the realities of building your own dream. There's a lot of uh, bad guys. And so, I mean, I know from my own experience, there's been times, many times in my life where I thought, my God, what have I gotten myself into? How am I going to get through this? such as bankruptcy, how am I going to ever rebuild my business? How am I going to live my dream? And then when you actually work through it, I remember, for example, when the stock market crashed in 2008, within four hours, I mean, within 24 hours, four check professionals reached out to me by phone call or email and said, one of my clients committed suicide because what they lost so much money they thought they would never be able to recover and couldn't bear to live a different lifestyle than they'd been living. And so you you see that, uh, for example, we lost about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the first year. So there was there, I remember one day we lost thirty five thousand dollars. I'm watching my business just dissolve right in front of me. I don't know. At one time we we're 
I think before that happened, we had 60 to 65 employees. We ended up going down to four to survive. I mean, we went to the skeleton crew where we could just keep the Institute alive. I had to work my ass off. But the point I'm making is I knew what I had to do. It's kind of like a, a, a ship that has a leaking hull. You can stand there and stare in the hull or you can get down there and start bailing water out and see if there's a way you can patch the hole no matter what you've got to do. But when I got to the day that Penny said, guess what, we're in, we're in the green again, even though I was exhausted, I had a real sense of accomplishment. I had a real sense of realizing that I can deal with tough problems. I mean, uh, uh, that was a big one. You know, that's a, l a lot of money to be <laughs> in the hole, right? Three quarters of a million dollars. You don't just pull that out of your ass and say, oh, no problem. You know, for me, that's a lot of work. And so I think that what's important for people listening to the podcast to realize, as you know, that real legitimate growth, personal, professional, or spiritual requires sacrifice. And, and if we keep wanting everything to be easy. I mean, it's like someone that wants to go to the gym and, and, and work out, but not sweat or <laughs> never get a blister or uh, get fit without actually the discomfort of pushing themselves, you know. But once you accomplish and you look back, you see that paradoxically, the hard times actually turn out to be the most important parts of your developmental life. Yeah. And you learn how to deal with them. At 62, I'm more equipped to deal with trouble now than I've ever been. Yeah. You know, since you didn't have Paul Check teaching you when you were younger, Paul Check, like, right. like I had the benefit from, I feel like the, the, what you just described to me and how it resonates in my experience is that the dream line, the feedback of being on your dream line is a contentment and spaciousness that allows for awful challenges and struggles to exist at the same time. Yeah. Um, so it all fits within me, and, mm -hmm. I, and I can handle it because I'm on my dream line. Yeah. What he's referring to is it's a tracking system I develop. In that process, I will have them do daily four doctor reports, and then they can continue the process, but each day they rank their performance relative to ideal, which is the dream line. So if you did manage each of your four doctors, you'd be right on the dream line. But if you forgot or made an excuse about not exercising, you would have to put down distracted. So it's a point system. And so you can look at your week, you can look at your month, you can look at your year, and you can see just like managing stock market flows or income through a business, you can look and see how well you're doing at living your dream line. So that's what the management system is. Hi, everybody. I know that you're all aware of the importance of vitamin C. There is a mountain of research on it, but not all C is created equally. I love Paleo Valley's Essential C Complex because it is the real deal, bioavailable, and I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith founder of Paleo Valley, why their Essential C Complex is so unique and something you definitely want for your family and your children. Autumn, tell us about your Essential C Complex. Well, I was shocked to learn as a holistic nutritionist that 90%, over 90% of the vitamin C on the market is derived from genetically modified corn, and then it's processed with highly volatile acids. And so I knew I had to find a better way to get all of the powerful benefits of vitamin C. So what I did was I dove into the research and I found the three most vitamin C rich superfoods on the planet. That's unripe acerola cherry and camu camu and omla berry. And then I just packed them into capsules. And the benefits are amazing because you're not only getting vitamin C, but all of the other wonderful benefits that come from these amazing superfoods. To try Paleo Valley's Essential C Complex and save 15% on your purchase, go to paleovalley.com forward slash C-H-E-K 15. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com forward slash C-H-E-K 15. No promo code is required. Enjoy. I was your client you're in a coaching relationship for a few years but i've remained your student um through integrating that work into my own life yeah the only reason that i stopped um with private coaching 
is because I felt like it was inappropriate of me to continue coming to meet with you until I had mastered what I had been given. I well, had, I was glad that, that you did that because it's easier for me to coach people that are doing the work. And, and you know, the challenge for someone like me is I have an internal sense of what I can get done or what I can do, but not realizing that we're not all equipped to make some of these changes the same. Like I might be very disciplined with my exercise because that's natural for me, but it might be hard for you. Or I may be very disciplined with food. I mean, I used to be a competitive fighter, so I had to learn to be disciplined with food, but a lot of people don't learn that. So it takes, my point is I might say, okay, I want you to do this and I want you to be ready to go to the next level in two weeks, but it might be that you're realizing that it's a lot harder to do than Paul thinks it is, <laughs> yeah. is what I'm saying. You know, and also like, you know, there's just a lot of people out there who continue paying people, sometimes many people, to be doing things for them. Right. And you're taking a lot of time and money. Yeah. And there's a lot of information that you've been given that, you know, you could likely benefit from slowing down with and mastering. What you just described is exactly what I, and I've many times stopped coaching with clients, say, look, you haven't even been able to, you haven't ever succeeded at doing a gong. And all I'm asking you to do is 20 minutes of Tai Chi for yourself. Uh, you haven't succeeded at cleaning your diet up. You haven't succeeded at exercising with any regularity. So why go any further? Because the further you go in a coaching process with a guy like me, the more discipline and the more honesty and the more time it usually takes because you go deeper into yourself. The point is the deeper you go, the more discipline it takes, the more honesty it takes, and the more strength it takes to make the journey. So if people can't manage four doctors, they're never going to do the real work, for for example, of real honest shadow work. That takes a lot to look at the depths of yourself and find the darkness in there and, and confront it because most people just do not want to know that. They're much happier just projecting that onto other people, you know, and then letting it be outside of themselves. And that way they can kind of divorce themselves from it and live their illusion quite unhappily. Yeah. So that's what we're going to ask the guys to do, you know, look into themselves, slow down, take the time to do these exercises, take the time to develop mindfulness practices around how they, how they move through the world, how they communicate and listen to their environment and the people in their environment. Um, and through the inspiration of people who have, you know, been doing it at the highest level. That's great because having a good mentor is, is quite a form of levity. You know, I've I've had a lot of great mentors in my life. Um, some of them very painful. You know, my father was a very painful mentor, but he really taught me discipline. He really taught me what I was capable of when it came to how much work I could do. <laughs> he taught me how to learn the difference between pain that's discomfort and pain that disables. Because for him, if it wasn't disabling pain, he had no interest in hearing about it. So I had to learn as a child, you know, a handful of blisters is not enough to stop swinging an axe if my dad's standing around, mm -hmm. you know. But I've had so many mentors that were unique in their own ways. Like I've had mentors that were genius therapists, but were just absolutely disgustingly bad at taking care of themselves. They could do anything to help other people, but they couldn't do a damn thing for themselves. So having spent so many years of my life studying with very highly developed people that were specific in their skill set, I saw that, you know, oftentimes with high levels of skill and genius comes an equal proportion of blindness in other areas of their life, which is one of the reasons I built the four doctor system to say, look, if you're a genius at anything, but you don't know how to eat, or you don't get to enough sleep, or you don't have time to reflect and be with yourself, then you're going to genius yourself right into a crisis. It'll be a relationship crisis, a money crisis, a health crisis. It'll be a crisis. And so I think that's one of the you know, great things about what you've learned implementing the four doctor systems and integrating Steiner's teachings 
yourself is that you you yourself realize that there's no way to escape four doctors if you want to make it to where you're sitting here on my podcast. <laughs> I mean, and the the Steiner stuff has just sort of deepened my because the Steiner stuff. I gave an example of those six exercises. That's actually rather practical. And biodynamic yeah. farming and Waldorf education; those are actually very practical applications yeah. of Steiner's teaching. But for those who are unfamiliar, the first 10, 15 years of his lectures weren't so practical. They were mostly spiritual. I would yeah. say. And so, um, he, he, as much as his work has inspired me, your work has been how I've directly applied it into my life. Mm -hmm. um, and so, maybe learning through Steiner's teachings about assigning words and levels of the living universe, you know, mm -hmm. breaking down the non visible living entities, maybe that has allowed my Dr. Quiet time or my nature connection time to really deepen yes. with philosophical, you know, underpinnings of, of his work. But I would say that, yeah, for Dr. Lifestyle is how I put things into action in, you know, in my life. And the four doctors have a tag, like a catch line, the last four doctors you'll ever need. How to get healthy now. Which I used to think was kind of just a funny little thing. But mm. honest to God, I don't think I've been to the doctor since I read the book. And, you know, it was like yeah. a dozen years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is uh, the only l real lens through which I, you know, try to achieve health. You mentioned this word a couple of times, willpower. And it does take a, a fair bit of willpower to step into your man boots, but it also takes won't power. You know, a lot of young people are good at stepping on the gas pedal. They just do it in the ways that they don't realize are actually contributing to their own distraction or their own poor health and vitality or lack of mental clarity or lack of direction in their life. But for example, an, an addiction, to heal an addiction requires a lot of won't power. In other words, if willpower is the gas pedal, won't power is the brake. When is enough enough? When is something not serving me any longer? I define an addiction as any repeated behavior that does not produce the results you want. So if you want to maintain a job and have a high level of responsibility so you can make a good income, having an addiction is a real bad combination with that. So the won't power has to step in. And, and this is why having a qualified dream is so important. Because if you don't have a qualified dream, you do not have a North Star on your compass, and you don't know when your willpower is driving you into a 90-degree angle that's off the dream line. In other words, you think, for example, oh, I can get rich quick if I can just sell a bunch of these uh, multi-level marketed air fresheners or air filters or whatever the, you know, get rich quick scheme of the year is not realizing a month or a year later you've spent all this time now you invested five thousand dollars you've only made six thousand dollars total but you've spent 150 or 200 hours doing it which means you've actually gone in the hole and that's all these hours that you could have been working on anything from developing your skills spending time with a mentor studying practicing uh, taking time to exercise, taking time to meditate, whatever whatever you needed to balance your four doctors. Yeah. So the the concept I'm sharing for everybody is you need to look carefully, not only at willpower, but where do you need a brake pedal? Because going like hell with no brake pedal is also uh, a great formula for disaster. I mean, for me, the solution is again mindfulness practice. Because if I'm sitting there at ten o'clock at night. And somewhere from my unconscious bubbles up the idea to go eat some chocolate ice cream. I could be, you know, halfway to the to the freezer before I have time to think about it. Right. And so to train my thinking to sort of look down at the threshold between my unconscious and conscious, that's where the will bubbles through, mm -hmm. you know, into my waking reality. And so Without my mindfulness practice, I would have no ability to even look at that thought. Right. And yeah, so you that, wouldn't that, even know it's there. Which is why these basic exercises are, you know, ultimately profound. Well, they're super important, uh, uh, and every every skill starts with the basics for sure. And if you don't have a mindfulness practice, then you simply stay unconscious, because any habit or behavior is by definition unconscious until you observe it. 
once you observe it, you say, oh boy, I really have a tendency to eat too much ice cream, or I have a tendency to stay up too late and make excuses, or whatever it might be. Once you start looking at it as a detached observer and say, wow, look at me, I have this habit, or I keep telling myself this story in my head to justify exactly what's led me to being obese or what's led me to losing jobs or what's led me to not being able to maintain relationships with the opposite sex or lovers or whatever it might be. And then now that you've put consciousness on it, it's changed. So if you, if you think of a cup sitting in the dark, if you can't see it, you can't pour anything into it. But once you see it, you can say, what can I use the cup for? Is it clean? Is it dirty? Is it useful? Is there more room for anything in it? Now the cup's not the same anymore because it's not isolated in the dark. It's not, it's not something that's unconscious. It's actually a tool you can use and you got to decide what you're going to do with it or if it's even something worth using, right? For example, if you find the cup's broken, then is it something you're going to fix do you want to drink out of something with crazy glue on it? Or do you need to replace the cup? Once you start adding energy to something, it changes. Just like when you add sunlight to a plant, it grows. So consciousness represents sunlight and the darkness represents the unconscious behaviors. So if we don't actually take the time through mindfulness to witness our own behaviors, our own self-management and relationships, then they just like the cup that's in the dark. You don't really know how to use it or if it's using you. That's one of the problems with phones. That's why I say a phone makes a better tool than a master. Many people are very unconscious about how their phone has taken them over, which is what your people on your rafting trip probably figured out. Like, wow, I bet you they went back and now they had a much higher level of awareness when the phone was an attractive fact, attractor factor that was sucking them out of what we'll call their dream line but they didn't have it before because they didn't have a means of becoming conscious until they went without it for four days. Right. So there you get to have the experience of pouring consciousness into the unconscious. And I think that's what the whole world needs right now. We have to start looking carefully at what we're doing unconsciously, habitually programmed to do often for other people's benefit, not our own, and then say, is this really serving me? And is it serving my family? And is it serving my community? And is it serving my culture? And is it serving the world? And if it isn't at any level, what do we do to stop pouring energy into it? Right? Like if we keep paying taxes like we are so people can use our tax money to kill us, that's not a very good idea. That's pretty unconscious. So at some point we're going to have to say, all right, enough of us are going to have to get together here and figure out how do we create a new financial system that actually supports people instead of just stealing from them. Hello, everybody. I sure hope you're enjoying this amazing podcast. I sure am. Did you know that Bioptimizer's Microbiome Breakthrough is my daily probiotic of choice? According to research, approximately 90% of people worldwide suffer from leaky gut syndrome. This means that undigested food particles are leaking through the lining of your small intestine, overloading your liver, and putting a chronic load on your immune system. As I show in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, this is the most common reason that more people today are suffering from debilitating food intolerances than ever before. Microbiome Breakthrough not only gives you a daily dose of essential probiotics to keep your microbiome healthy, it is designed to support healing the wall of your small intestine so your liver and immune system can rest and you can digest your food effectively. Not only is this one of my all-time favorite products, it tastes great and is easy to use. To get started on Microbiome Breakthrough now and get 10% off as a Living 4D listener, go to bit.ly forward slash Microbiome Paul 10. That's B I T dot L Y forward slash Microbiome Paul 10. Enjoy your healthy gut. One thing I wanted to ask you before we close the podcast is 
we were talking about your products. There's a product of yours, the skin serum that I've been using for years. The course, summer solstice serum. Right. Last time you gave me a couple bottles of it, and I only used one drop with my um, my uh, one farm skin cream that I like because it's got this real nice combination of, of uh, CBD and other oils for uh, healing and, and controlling inflammation. It just happens to work well for me. I have a hard time finding skin creams that have the right thickness. They're either too sticky and gooey. Or they're too thin, they dry out, and two hours later, it's like you're you got nothing on. So I found that when I put one drop of your winter solstice, summer sum, solstice, summer solstice yeah. in into my skin cream, it balanced it out perfectly. Point being is, I've had it since you gave me, and I'm only now running out because I only needed one drop, and it just completely changed the formula and made it perfect for me. And so that led me today asking you, you know, what have you still got available? It turns out you actually still do have a bunch of products available from Be Here Farm. Yeah, no, the farms, so, you know, the farm took about a year to recover, yeah. at which point we continued uh, making all of the products. There was actually a moment in time when the fire occurred where I evacuated with the ingredients for the summer solstice serum because I had a deadline a week or two later to get them to our friend sunpotion.com. Right. That's where the serum launched online for the first time ever. Had we known the fire was going to burn everything down, I certainly would have taken everything with me. I would have right. taken, you know what I mean? But all of the other products that we had made for that year, because we grow them, we don't buy these wholesale from factories and right. then make them no, in, a, in a kitchen any time of year. So we, we make them at the end of the growing season. And that's one of the reasons they're not cheap. Yeah. Because they're hand yeah. farm they're handmade i mean this is like exactly the real deal this is not some factory fluff yeah they're not cheap but they're they're good value because you know you many of our clients report replacing multiple other products in their arsenal and simply using this like i for example have not washed my face in seven or eight years except for with water or our summer solstice serum mm -hmm. so there's a process of doing like a five minute face massage with the serum mm -hmm. to then basically oil pull like people do yeah, with their teeth everything. Yep. yeah it, it takes off makeup grit grime exfoliates very yeah. gently it, it, it really conditions your skin um so our entire product collection is now available so we regrew and now have continued to regrow all of our products so we have three serums i just gave penny another one um so we have three different serums each with slightly different purposes you can check them out on our website mm -hmm. beherefarm.com and then we have two uh, face and body masks that mm. we actually make in collaboration with Sun Potion. So some of their superfoods are in these masks. Mm. Um, we have some hydrating essences, which is through the process of distillation. When you distill for making essential oils, there's actually two components, the water and the oil. The oil rises to the top. You take that off. That's the essential oil. The water is now a face and body mist with the same aromatherapeutic benefits mm. of essential oil, but yeah. just appropriate for your essential oils can be really volatile and harsh on yeah. people's skin so this is a water-based product a lot of times they're preserved with alcohol so then you wouldn't maybe want to use it as much Dry but out. ours don't have anything in it besides the it, it's called a hydrosol that's mm. that's what they're called um and then we have the lip treatment which you love mm -hmm. which is honey beeswax and our oils that the you're problem is describing it so damn good i want to eat the damn stuff so like my, my da daughter does <laughs> yeah my daughter has eaten the whole thing she's eaten the whole a whole lip balm you know like she'll I, I give her a lip balm and then a week later she'll ask me for a lip balm and i'll say sweetheart what happened to the lip balm i just gave you and she said oh it got moldy and i said i said what do you mean it got moldy i was like that's a major problem you got to show it to me because if it's moldy, that might mean that there's a hundred of them that are moldy. This is a major issue. So she brought me into her room and she handed me the bottle. And yeah, there was a bit of mold in it, but it was because of her swipey little fingers and the whole thing was empty. Yeah. So it was empty with a dot of mold in the bottom because she had been fingering it and eating the lip balm for the last week. Yeah, when you gave me one a while back, I Zoe loves lip balm. She went through a lip balm fanaticism. Where she would just like put ten cakes of lip balm. She would like be so happy to show everybody how shiny her lips were, and I would catch her dipping her finger into your lip balm and eating it, you know. And then it makes sense. That checks looking out. Looking at me like, Daddy, this is really good. <laughs> yeah, I mean the wet mask too. The 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 face mask I was just describing. One's dry, one's wet, and the wet mask is 
primarily honey. So kids really do like to eat it and you might want to just keep an eye on it if you have your kids around. But also I should say these things are very safe for children and my daughter has her own self-care regimen. You know, she comes home and we have bath salts as well. So she comes home, she takes our bath salts which are scented with our essential oils that we distill on the farm. She puts them in the bath. She turns on an audio book. She puts a face mask on her face and she takes a bath every single day. Wow, that's cool. Um, so these are cradle to grave, you know, mm. safe. They're, yeah. they're, we have clients of, of all age and both genders. And um, yeah, so all those products are available uh, on BeHereFarm.com yes. as well as the men's group. That's where people can go check it out. Um, and then the live events that we were talking about, right. uh, we, in, in 2024, we have another rafting trip with Eben Britton, who was just on the show. And then a musician and sound healer named Do Perot, who's my favorite musician in the world. Really? She, yeah. I've uh, never even heard of him. Yeah. Is it a man or a woman? It's a woman, a, a wonderful woman that I actually met at Oberlin college. So she's performed at every major event in my life, our wedding, our, you know, Phyllis's 35th birthday on the river trip so she's a wow. major part of her life very talented sound dealer and musician um and then the same two people are coming with be here to italy so we're doing seven nights at an agriturismo in italy 70 acre property unbelievable food you know we're going to be hiking the mountains and biking and doing the stuff that eben and sonia sonia is her real name that's her stage name dopero but oh. the two of them will be leading people through yoga and breath work and chanting and singing and um, everything that they bring to the table. So, yeah, all that's on BeHereFarm.com. Plenty of ways for people to get in touch with us. And then um, the code for listeners is CHECK2024. And that's got uh, a lot of, you know, you have a lot of opportunities to use that because there's uh, the men's group, which has a $500 discount okay, great. for CHECK2024. And then the products is a... 10% discount on okay. the entire product collection. And how long again is the men's group? 12 weeks? 12 weeks starting February 8th is the first one. And I think you come in a, a week after that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, great. Well, thanks. What a great conversation. I think we've uh, addressed a lot of key issues and uh, looked at transitional states, the challenges of, of becoming a man and being a man. We've looked at... Um, the importance of a dream, goals and objectives, qualifying them, willpower, won't power, the danger of fire, but how it can also release you from yourself. And um, we've uh, talked about your amazing products, which uh, every time you come with little packages for the girls, they get very excited because they, I, I love your products too. I mean, the one thing that, I think your products do is they show you the difference between what you could get by someone that really knows how to farm and make things versus what you used to think was really good. You know, like you, whatever a woman's favorite product is that she buys on the internet or goes to some store at a shopping mall to get, even if it's $200 a unit, when she tries be here products, the the difference is so night and day in the actual functionality and the experience of them. I mean, I mean, I'm not a, I'm a I'm a pretty hardcore guy. I'm not a big put it on my face, be pretty. But when I put your uh, serum on my face, it's like, oh wow, you know, here it is, eight hours later, and my skin's not all dried out, and my and I don't feel greasy either. I feel like my body's saying yes to that, and I think that's. That's what makes spending money rewarding, right? It's like if I buy a car that looks good but breaks down all the time, every time I have to pay the payment on it, it irritates me. But when you buy something that really works, like <laughs> when I bought my Audi, I went, I will never buy, ever, will I ever buy an American-made car again? Because no matter what that thing looks like, it will not perform even close to an Audi. I mean, the precision in an Audi is unbelievably different than an American car. And so the analogy being is when you get super high quality products that are you know, grown by you using Steiner's principles, the level of vitality in them and the life force and, and, and the, just the authenticity of you're your, your really holding on to the sun, the earth, and the moon like a living 
product. Yeah, that's, I mean, like if I could just speak to that for a second, because most, pro- like even certified organic products, the over, if you're making products at a commercial scale, you're, prim- unless you're like me, you're sourcing them from industrial agriculture. Yep. So it could be organic, certified organic, but it's still going to be a large monoculture using organic fertilizers, pesticides, and insecticides. Yeah. So those plants are are pretty dialed in to their nutrition coming right from sometimes even through the water. You know, mm-hmm. it's like they're being like um like they have an IV in them of nutrition. Yeah. So they don't have to um relate to the sun and the moon or the earth very much mm-hmm. they're just getting force fed more or less it's like someone that takes vitamins all day and their stomach gets weaker and weaker because it doesn't have any reason to pull them out of the food exactly so the plant becomes dull our plants are you know in a deep relationship with all the things we just mentioned in which case it becomes much more self-aware of itself it becomes yes. more of itself what do i mean by that nutrient density it's more full of itself, literally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you would have to eat 200 pieces of hydroponically grown spinach to get the antioxidants present in one leaf of properly grown yeah. biodynamic spinach. Yes. You might have to eat like 100 carrots to get the polyphenols present in one properly grown carrot. So when you look at our ingredients, you're going to recognize the ingredients because I'm only using whole foods. Right. So you're going to recognize them. Chamomile, calendula. These are words you've heard of. They could yeah. have been in your lunch. Yeah. But... They're grown at a cleanliness and nutrient density that is, statistically speaking, probably unlike anything you've experienced to date because 0.002% of U.S. farmland is certified biodynamic and some 90-odd percent of that is dedicated to wine grapes. Mm. So there's practically 0% of the stuff available. Right. Granted, close to 0% is still sort of, there's a lot of us out there. You know, I can network with growers all across the country and find this kind of stuff happening in almost everybody's neighborhood. So you just got to get on the internet and start networking, meet your farmers, find brands like ours that either are doing it themselves or have done the work for you in terms of sourcing and, you know, apply that lens of mindfulness to your decisions. Perfect. Well, what a great podcast. Thank you. Thank you to my sponsors for all your amazing products and your sustainable and regenerative practices. And thanks to all of you for listening and learning and growing with me. I always enjoy my guests because I get to learn a lot of things and grow with you. And uh, thanks for making it your intention to make the world a little ba- uh, little better place each day for all living beings, not just human beings, but all living beings. I look forward to sharing something exciting with you next week, every Tuesday, a new surprise on Living 4D. See you then. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Jared Picard. To find Jared and Be Here Farm online, go to beherefarm.com and on Instagram at beherefarm. You can also read more about the upcoming events, Be Slow in Umbria in May and The Solar Return live in Hell's Canyon in June. Jared is offering Paul's listeners 10% of all products in the Be Here self-care product collection. Go to beherefarm.com and use the code CHECK2024. That's C-H-E-K, the number 2024. You can learn more about the upcoming 12-week online men's group, Be Here Man, at beherefarm.com forward slash gatherings or email love at beherefarm.com. Be Here Man is a shared experience for male transformation and growth, focusing on somatic experience, observation, movement, and mindfulness, featuring six live conversations between group members and visiting masters, including your podcast host, Paul Check, international acclaimed waterman, Laird Hamilton, and revered American visionary artist, Alex Gray. Living 4D podcast listeners save $500 using the code CHECK2024. So go to beherefarm.com forward slash gatherings or email love at be here farm and be sure to mention the code check 2024 that's c-h-e-k and the numbers 2024
Catch up with Paul on Instagram, TikTok and threads at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. This podcast would not be possible without the support of our premier sponsors by Optimizers, Organifi and Paleo Valley and our podcast sponsor, Wild Pastures. Please show your appreciation by taking advantage of their special discounts for listeners. The links are in the show notes. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts, and YouTube.